House of Representatives to reintroduce diaspora voting bill. And Joe Biden insists that the U.S. midterm elections was a good day for democracy. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Annika. The House of Representatives Committee on Diaspora has promised to reintroduce the Diaspora Voting Bill to accommodate Nigerians living abroad. Chairman of the committee, Tolulokwe Shadikbe, uh, said this when the chairman of the and the chief executive officer of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Abike Dabirewa, appeared before the committee for the defense of the agency's 2023 budget. It was reported that the budget was rejected by lawmakers during the Constitution Amendment exercise. However, Shadipe expressed hope that the diaspora voting uh, bill would be passed this time, saying that uh, it was the direction where the world was going and that Nigeria must not be left behind. Responding, Dabirewa urged Nigerians to stop migrating um, to other countries if they did not have jobs there. Well, joining us to discuss this is Right Honorable John Gall Labour. He is the immediate past speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly. So good to have you join us, Mr. Labour. Thank you very much. Good evening. Great. Um, re revisiting this um, idea of diaspora voting, I mean, when we were pushing for uh, other electoral reforms and, and what made it into the 2022 amended electoral act. Um, most people were hoping uh, upon hope that this would be, this would have made its way into, um, you know, that act. But what do you think uh, uh, could have been responsible for the National Assembly kicking against it? I think um, the first is um, basic reason would be that no strong uh, foundation was laid for the purpose of um, engaging the parties involved. Uh, I believe that the National Assembly was not properly engaged uh, to that extent. You know, it's not, it's not just the committee members. You have to deal with the issues of um, uh, bringing that issue to the fore, to the, um, to the House as a whole. Now, diaspora voting um, is a, a new dimension in electoral uh, reform in the sense that, you know, there is always a diaspora content of every country. There is a percentage of every society of every country that are resident outside of that country. And they play an important role in driving public opinion, particularly on a lot of issues. They also are able to influence a lot of issues for a country abroad. They are a content and a part of our foreign relations. And so even when you go into issues of crowdfunding or sourcing for funds outside of Nigeria, you know, for uh, international development projects, even for uh, political parties in the elections, we need the diaspora content. So I believe that the proper foundation was not laid uh, before uh, the relevant committee of the House. Uh, probably there was no good lobby strategy as well within the House. Um, let me take you back to when we were having the electoral reforms. INEC um, actually made a case for that diaspora voting. In fact, um, INEC said, I'd like to quote them, that they believe that Nigerians living outside the country uh, should have the right to vote for a variety of reasons. They said that they are citizens of Nigeria interested in the affairs of their own country uh, and th that they make considerable contributions uh, to the economy through huge financial inflow. So why should they not have a right in making sure that the right person sits on that seat as president? So again, INEC did make a case Maybe the commission did not make a case like you said, but how much lobbying does it have to take for something as important as Nigerians living outside Nigeria, um, you know, to be able to be part of, you know, the, the electoral process? We see this happen. Um, the Americans who live within us, uh, the Brits who live, in fact, they send their votes by post half the time. Uh, or could it be that maybe as a country we haven't gotten to the point where we can trust those votes that are coming from outside? And what could be our, possibly be the fear? Uh, I think that you must understand the difference between uh, developing countries, civilized countries, and then cosmopolitan societies. Uh, Nigeria is a, um, a developing country. Uh, we're not a developed country. So 
Um, the I issue of diaspora voting and diaspora right is not something that has been embedded in Nigeria. It's not such a content that has been um, that has become a part of our society. And so a lot of people are driven at this different levels of society. They find it difficult to understand what that content is. Now, when you introduce such a bill or such a content into our law, now what you require is that it is not about your perspective understanding or the perception you have about the intelligence of legislators that matter. It is whether you have been able to carry out that uh, intellectual and cultural orientation within the members of the House Committee, the Players House Committee, or the leadership of the House. Now, no matter how important that issue is, you still need to download it to the perspective understanding of the legislature per time. Now, when you look at the legislative direction of the National Assembly, the question is that, can you see diaspora, uh, be, uh, diaspora right as part of the priority of this present legislature? Is it part of their legislative direction? Do they have a subcommittee on diaspora in the House of Representatives? What is the opinion of the leadership of the House of Representatives? What is the opinion of the committee members? What is the opinion of the Constitutional Amendment Committee in the House? You need to lobby that across. You know, remember the issue, how the issue of um, um, uh, uh, electric cars uh, by Elon Musk failed before the National Assembly, just before the COVID-19. It's the same issue. It's lack of that um, education, electoral education. So I believe that if it's been introduced good, but they must go back and do the basic thing right. First thing first, they have to go back to the leadership of the House. They have to go back to their own so their own committee must also be lobbied to be on the table. Mr. Lebo, are you still there? Can you hear me? I think uh, we have a, we had a little connection lost there. Can you hear me? The house is being, yes, it's only if the House is convinced that they can form part of the issues that they deliberated on the floor. No matter how important that issue is, you still need to convince the leadership of the House, the subcommittee sub of the House, the House, the Committee on uh, Constitutional Amendment to be able to present that issue. Okay. Um, I'm still, I'm, I'm here wondering what kind of conviction the National Assembly needs to, uh, if the people themselves, if Nigerians are saying, we need diaspora voting, we need the voices of the people who are outside our shores to participate. Uh, I'm trying to understand what kind of conviction they want. But then there are people who are of the opinion that this might be purely political. Um, and this might also have been mostly voted against because of those who are most interested in electoral malpractice, being that that might one way or the other trump the regular, um, you know, um, deductions that these so-called corrupt uh, po politicians would have in preparation for the elections for those who are in Nigeria? Well, I think, I think that you must... I, I'm trying to make this point, and this point, you must get it very correct, or right, so to say. No matter how important an issue is, you still need to, you still need to drag it down to the level and understanding of the legislature. It's critical. Don't assume that I understand what it means or that it is part of their direction or is a priority. Remember that, that this assembly, you know, has a legislative direction. There are priority areas in the legislature which is... Mr. Lebo, are you still there? I think that we lost that connection again. Subject of have to be able to get it to go, to go along with you on that issue. Now, no matter how important the issue is, the reason why you even have issues of public uh, explanation in the legislature is to be able to get the relevant institutions or agencies responsible for a particular bill, especially this, that is like a private member bill, or even if it's a public uh, uh, a, a bill sponsored by government, you still need to bring it and educate the members and align it with the legislative policy for the year. So at the end of the day, the members, a lot of the activists within the diaspora community would have, would have to lobby this bill to go through. Remember that they're not too young uh, to, to run the bill. Yes. Uh, bill. As important as Germany as well, we, we, they have to be lobbied 
You understand? It was mm. lobby to the end, and they had groups that followed it to the end. Remember that even the issue of uh, uh, BIVAS, voting system, electronic transmission of results, there were groups that followed it. You remember the role of Governor Wiki and a few other PDP governors who talked about electronic transmission. The first process came, it was not there, and then it was continued. So you have to get that point right. The legislature is an institution. They have body of knowledge. Any issue that you're bringing, no matter how important it is, you must bring it in line with the understanding, perspective, perspective understanding, and perceptual understanding of the legislature. That is a foundation. Once they understand it and it's in line with their own policy, you have to run at that point. If it's not, no matter how important it is, it won't go. <clears throat> Don't forget also that even issues like budgets that are presented by ministries of very important ministries like health, like water resources, like defense, they still need to go to the legislature to defend it. They need to lobby the legislature to get it right. So it is a, it is a structural problem uh, that has to be done uh, before that can go through. You can't, you can't throw the bill at the legislature and expect them to understand. No. You, you, you just, a few questions they, they will need to ask. They may need a methodology. They may need data. They may need to formulate the issues. They may need a few information. They may look at templates available in other countries. Why do we need it now? Why can't it be later? Those are some of the issues. It's not the argument for or against. It is the fact that you must bring that within the body of knowledge of the legislature and it must be in line with the legislative direction of the House. Okay. Apparently also uh, certain people in the Senate Committee um, on, on Electoral Reforms had also lent their voice to this issue. I'd like to quote somebody, uh, Senator Oko, um, Rose Oko, I had advised the commission, that's INEC, uh, to look into the possibility of including Nigerians in diaspora in the vote. She said, and I quote, we this, in the Senate committee do believe that we would lend our voice very strongly to the call that Nigerians in diaspora uh, should be given an opportunity to exercise their franchise and vote in the country um, where you know, they are from for several reasons, end of quote. Now let's move on to other things that um, we have included now as part of our electoral reforms in 2022. Um, many have called for um, INEX, um, well, they're saying INEC needs to be sure that the beavers would not be hacked, uh, the real-time transferring of results uh, would not be hacked, that the process will be properly, properly watertightly secured. Um, but do you have any concerns? Because at some points, people were concerned uh, that there might just be some leakages on election day. But with the introduction of the beavers and what you've seen in Anambra, uh, in Ekiti, and in Oshun elections, uh, are you certain that um, the beavers would be a game changer? Yes, I, I, I believe that the beavers would be a game changer. You know, the beaver system has been introduced in Bismuth. First, you had the cat breeder, which was used in the last election partially. And then now it transmitted into the country. It's been a part of a gradual technological reform process. Now, one of the things you must configure with technology and law is that no matter how water type the technology is, you must create an error margin. Your error margin shouldn't be more than 10%. Worst case scenario, uh, even if it's corrupted or manipulated or tempered, it shouldn't be more than 10% because it is. Oh dear. Uh, again, we are having... More than 10% will affect the result of the election. If it's less than 10... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, so, so the point I'm making is that with technology and law, what you want is to reduce the error margin to be below 10%. Once it's below 10%, it may not affect the election. If it's above 10%, it may affect the result of the election. Now, for with Beavers, the, what we have seen, the case, best case scenario we have seen from a, from a kitty to Oshun for up to Anambra election and a few other run like the ones that happened in Crossiba. You know, it is very obvious and clear that the error margin in the beavers is very low and that there are no fears at all, unless there are new challenges that will arise in the 2023 election, because we have not used it in the general election for the general election is a bigger is the bigger case scenario. So we are going to see the worst case scenario circumstance with the beaver. But I'm I'm very hopeful that the beavers technology will be able to withstand it. They will have firewall proof. It's, every tech, new technology has very wonderful firewall proof. And I'm very convinced that uh, the error margin may not be up to 5%, and uh, the integrity of the elections will not be compromised. 
Looking at the floods that have taken place, of course, some would call it a natural disaster, but then, of course, it's still between the government of Nigeria and the government of Cameroon and who didn't build the dam and why the situation is this bad. Um, do you see this posing a problem for the elections? Because, again, uh, several houses have been, you know, immersed in that water, submerged, I beg your pardon. Um, we've seen farmlands all gone. Um, what's the possibility that these waters might recede before the elections proper? Well, you know, we are, we are the, towards the end of the rainy season. And uh, for um, most of our hinterland, we're entering towards the dry season, which will begin from November, December, January, February, March. So between the period of the election, this is like three to four months of now, we are going through dry season. So I, I'm, I, I think that with technology and with all the... Um, uh, flooding uh, tools that have been available, the water levels will go down. If the water levels don't go down in particular places like Bayasawe, I, I think they have the worst case or Ipoke state, you know, they may have to designate new voting area because what you find is that it's like IDPs, you know, the IDPs that are voting in, uh, in uh, Medugri in the northeast because of the Boko Haram crisis, they had to be relocated to new uh, uh, voting points to vote because they can't vote within the environment out of security. Now, because of flooding too, a lot of them may not, who may not be able to vote, and then we have to make arrangements. Because the areas that are already flooded, you won't find human beings inside water. They probably, they are in IDP camp. So, I we will probably have to make arrangements for um, IDP uh, accreditation centers in those, in those areas. I don't think it will affect the postponement of the whole election. Maybe uh, postpone election in certain states that are highly worst hit, but I believe that INEC should be able to configure working with uh, relevant environmental experts and uh, meteorologists, they should be able to set up IDP centers uh, within that period. Um, finally, insecurity, vote buying, um, campaign of calumny and electoral violence. Um, do you, how well do you think political parties have done in making sure that that is not the order of the day, being that many have also touted this election to be one that w might make or mar us? Um, especially vote buying being the only option that politicians, corrupt ones, might be able to explore. How well do you think that, um, how much work do you think has gone into making sure that people look beyond that, especially at a time like this where a bag of rice goes for more than 50,000 naira? Well, I, I think that um, I've always maintained that our biggest challenge to the elections uh, over around our legal, our in an ineffective legal framework and a very poor regulatory framework. Uh, political parties are set up by strategic pressures by law, and then the condition upon which they are created is the uh, foundation of their creation is provided in the law. And then that law provides a regulatory institution in INEC to carry that regulation. Any law that does not have a good regulatory framework will just fail. And which is what you're finding now. I think we need to sit up. They need to back and bite to be able to deal with the issue of um, uh, political parties' compliance with their own statutory provisions. Look at the number of pre-election cases that have arisen. Look at the number of states that the courts have had to cancel their processes because the political parties themselves can't even respect their own rules. Or because the courts have looked at it that the parties themselves lack the capacity to obey, understand, and respect their rules. So that has been a big problem. So I believe that what needs to happen aspect. The second aspect, the political parties themselves, you know, you know, we have to look beyond INA. We need to begin to look at security agencies. If this election is going to go and we're expecting a free and fair election, then the election security must be top notch. We must police the election well. If we're policing the elections well with all the security agencies on ground, why will anybody buy votes? If we are policing the voting area and voting points, why will anybody buy votes? So it is only the compromise of the security agencies, the partisan nature of the security agencies, the partisan nature of INEC and INEC staff that will bring us into that kind of crisis. Because the electoral rules are very clear. Mm. You cannot go to a police station and won't find security personnel. Why will anybody get to the polling units to go and buy votes? And then that can be taken care of. So a compromise system will allow that to happen. The system is what that, that will happen. In terms of campaign of calumny, it's always been political, I call it political banter, you know, and then parties have been made to sign peace accord. Why can't they implement peace accord? And um, you're already 
you begin to find very unfortunate situations, like reminding you of 2011, what happened in 2011, that already uh, the PDP campaign, which I belong to, uh, campaign trail of uh, Atiku Abubaka, has already been attacked in Kaduna and now in Medikuri. That is a very sad incident. And then you hear political parties blaming themselves. I'm happy that the Inspector General of Police has set up a committee to investigate that. It is an area, a black spot that we must trace. If we don't get it right, um, when other political parties start, this will become the other. They remember that in 2015, you know, uh, 2014, 2015 election, President Jonathan, as sitting president, was attacked several times by talks. Uh, as I said, as sitting president without the security. So we are sitting on a time bomb, and I believe that we must sit up all the various support institutions to INEC must sit up and be able to help INEC to put this to INEC themselves. They are too small in the circumstances of finance set to be able to tackle the issue of vote buying, tackle the issue of campaign of calumny, the uh, issue of political talk. Security agencies must get up because an election is a security project. Yeah. Okay. Well, John Gold Labour is a former, well, he's immediate past a speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly. Thank you so much for speaking with us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you for staying with us. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll be taking a look at the U.S. midterm elections and what uh, it says and how it applies to their foreign policy and their relations with other nations, especially the continent of Africa. Stay with us.